you know, it's really amazing that humans can actually survive and operate in really significant pressures. And today, I want to talk about the different effects that pressure actually has on the human body. Now, there are three main points here. One is the effect of pressure on general body tissues. Two is the effect of pressure on our blood. And three is the effect of pressure on our brain. So we're going to focus mostly on brain issues, but I want to get the other two out of the way first. So the effect that pressure has on the general human body and our regular tissues, muscle, skeleton, internal organs, is rather remarkably minimal. Uh, the human body is comprised of and filled with mostly water. Water's non-compressible, and so as you dive relatively deep, even like ludicrously deep by scuba standards, the pressure doesn't really have many physiological effects on the body itself, because the body just kind of matches the exterior pressure, and there aren't any problems. Now, where this definitely doesn't apply is gases. Gases are very much compressible. And, uh, of course, we have a significant gas exchange system built into the human body. That would be your lungs and your breathing. Now, uh, when you breathe, gases come into the body, into the lungs, where gas molecules are then exchanged into the blood. So there's a there's a direct air-to-blood connection um, available in the lungs. That allows us to take oxygen molecules out of the air into our bloodstream, which then circulates through the body and disperses into tissues that use the oxygen to live. The place that becomes an issue when you're diving is that as you are under higher pressure, these gases will not just exchange chemically into the blood, but also physically dissolve into the blood. The, the classic metaphor for this is the dissolved carbon dioxide in a soda pop. Um, you know when you open it, there's a lot of there's more pressure inside a soda bottle than there is outside. And when you open it, you hear the hiss, and gas comes out, and bubbles will often form in the soda. So that's what's happening to your bloodstream in particular, but really all of your bodily tissues when you're under pressure. That uh, primarily nitrogen gas, which comprises seven, approximately 79% of normal air, when you're under pressure will dissolve into tissues. Frankly, it dissolves into your tissues when you're just at normal atmospheric pressure. It's just that's kind of the body's normal operating condition, and it doesn't cause any issues. As you dive, you, your pressure increases by one atmosphere roughly every 10 meters or 33 feet deep that you go. So sitting here at roughly sea level recording this video, I am under one atmosphere of pressure. If I were to dive to 33 feet, I am now under two atmospheres of pressure. Like I said before, this doesn't do much to the body, but it does mean that the gas coming out of my tank into my regulator and into my lungs is coming into my lungs at two atmosphere. My whole body is essentially at two atmospheres of ambient pressure, and that means I'm going to have two atmospheres worth of nitrogen able to dissolve into all of my bodily tissues and remain at equilibrium. As I go down and spend more time at deeper depths, more and more of that nitrogen will dissolve into bodily tissues. As I come up, that will start to uh, outgas, I suppose is the term, out of your bodily tissues. And, uh, and it does so, basically it will outgas until it reaches a level of equilibrium for whatever pressure you're at. Now, where this causes problems is the classic decompression sickness. If you come up too fast, that outgassing gets faster and faster and faster, and it can look like just popping the lid off of a soda and having it foam and explode all over the place. That essentially happens to your tissues and your blood. Nitrogen forms significant sized bubbles, uh, and you suffer symptoms that can range from relatively benign skin rash, mild joint pain, to straight up death. Um, agonizing, horrible death, in fact. Um, ascending slowly and decompressing yourself as you come up is a critical tenet of safe scuba diving. So that's how the gases affect your blood and tissues. But the effect that I really want to talk about today, because there's a lot of material on decompression, it's pretty well understood, uh, well, sort of well understood, but a lot of talk about it. 
what I want to focus on today is actually the effect of gases under pressure on your brain, because that causes a whole bunch of different effects. The two that we're going to look at today are the ones that are impacted uh, or result from breathing of regular air while you're scuba diving. So there are really only two gases that we're concerned with, oxygen and nitrogen. Regular air is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen plus a few trace elements of other things that are in such small quantity that they just don't matter for our purposes today and we can ignore them. Now, as you dive deeper, again, you get the same impact, essentially the same effect of gases dissolving into your tissues, but in the case of the brain, they're coming through your bloodstream. Uh, gas that's dissolved in the blood will then, uh, like basically through osmosis, it will bleed itself into brain tissues and different gases at different uh, relative densities or different partial pressures will have different effects on the brain. When it comes to oxygen, the impacts go from essentially nothing to basically death uh, <laughs> very quickly. Uh, this is actually called oxygen toxicity, and you may think this is weird because it's not that uncommon for a person to breathe 100% pure oxygen and that causes no adverse effects. In fact, it actually is beneficial for a lot of situations. The fact is, oxygen becomes toxic when it's present at about 160% of, well, 160% partial pressure based on a one atmosphere normal. So, kind of obvious question is how on earth do you get 160% oxygen? Well, you pressurize it. So, if we have a a container of oxygen that has 100 oxygen molecules in it, and there's nothing but oxygen in there. At one atmosphere at sea level, that's 100% oxygen. It's a 1.0 partial pressure. Well, if I take that container of oxygen and I drop it underwater 33 feet, now it's sitting at two atmospheres of pressure. Uh, the number of oxygen mo molecules hasn't changed, but they've now been squished into half as much space, and so the density of oxygen molecules in there has doubled. We now have a 2.0 or 200% partial pressure of oxygen. This happens to all of the gases in your scuba tank. Now, the tank is rigid. Uh, the tank, you know, the tanks are at let's say 3,000 psi when they're filled, and that doesn't change. But what does change is the pressure that comes out of the regulator, because the regulator is going to provide pressure to balance out the ambient pressure. So the deeper you go, the higher pressure the air that you're breathing out of your tank. So let's say we are breathing regular air. It is 21% oxygen, so at the surface we have an oxygen partial pressure of 0.21. I dive to 33 feet. I add a second atmosphere of pressure, now I'm at 0.42. If you run these numbers, you'll see that eventually you do get over 100% partial pressure of oxygen, and you hit that 1.6 danger zone at about 215 feet. Now this is well below the, the recreational diving depth limit, it's almost double the depth limit for recreational divers, so it's not really a, a practical issue that scuba divers, regular recreational scuba divers, have to deal with. But it is an issue for technical divers, and back before the early 90s, people were doing remarkably deep dives, dives down to that sort of level, breathing pure oxygen, and they did start, they did report issues of oxygen toxicity. And, I mean, predating scuba, oxygen toxicity has been a known thing in pressurized environments. So the symptoms of oxygen toxicity essentially are convulsions. Um, ox too, much, too many oxygen molecules dissolving into your neurons will interfere with their capacity to interact and properly act like neurons, and the result is convulsions. Now underwater, ab above, above water convulsions are convulsions, they're not great, but like you fix the issue. You reduce the amount of oxygen the person's exposed to through whatever means, and the problem goes away. Underwater, convulsions typically mean you spit out your regulator, you're unable to do anything about it, and then you drown. Uh, not an optimal solution, not an optimal outcome. So oxygen toxi toxicity deaths, uh, or depth, is something that is very important to keep track of, but not really relevant just for plain air breathing recreational scuba divers. The other... Uh, you now, where this does start to become a little bit of an issue for scuba, for normal scuba, is with 
blends of gas that involve more oxygen than normal. And the one that gets used a lot is called nitrox, where instead of 21 oxygen, 79 nitrogen, you've artificially boosted the amount of oxygen in your tank to 32 or 36 percent, with the balance still being nitrogen. Now this is done so that you reduce the amount of nitrogen you're breathing, so you have less issues with decompression and nitrogen narcosis, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But it does mean that you're double, nearly doubling the amount of the not, not just the amount of oxygen, but the partial pressure of oxygen that you're breathing. So instead of being at 0.21 at the surface and 0.42 10 meters down, now you're 0.36 on the surface and you're 0.72 when you're down 10 meters or 33 feet. And if you run the numbers on that, you'll discover that you get to that danger zone a lot more quickly, like less than 150 feet. And that danger zone is the point where convulsions have been known to occur. So most people aren't going to use 1.6 as like the limit they'll dive to. Most people are going to add a safety factor and say, well, I'll dive to 1.4 or 1.5 or something like that. And that brings your maximum allowable depth up to the point that it can be easily within recreational scuba diving limits. So the, basically the key element in understanding how to safely use nitrox is to recognize that you have to test the gas to know exactly what the, the oxygen content is, and then you have to know exactly what depth you can safely descend to breathing that gas, so that you do not become a victim of oxygen toxicity. Now the good news here is this, this uh, effect, and nitrogen narcosis as well, can be remedied just by coming up to a shallower depth. Gas doesn't tend to linger in, in the brain cells the way that we have issues with gas dissolved in blood, requiring, you know, you have, to, you have to let that out relatively slowly. When it comes to gas dissolved in the brain, you come up in depth and you don't have to go very far before you have a significant impact on the change in partial pressure of gas that you're breathing. And that almost immediately translates into the, you know, the, the pressure uh, or the, the, the amount of gas that's dissolved in your brain. So these symptoms can go away very quickly just by coming up in depth, even a relatively modest amount. So um, nitrox takes us nicely over into the effects of nitrogen when it's dissolved in high partial pressures inside the brain. It's not called nitrogen toxicity, it's called nitrogen narcosis, which is indicative of a different set of symptoms. This is typically uh, compared to the effect of alcohol. And the symptoms of nitrogen narcosis can be widely varied. And they start relatively benign, and they get more and more severe as you get deeper. So it's generally agreed and recognized that nitrogen narcosis will start at about 100 feet of depth, about 33 meters, and then increase in severity as you go deeper beyond that. But the depth where you see symptoms and the severity of the symptoms can be a very individual thing, not just different between people, but different in the same person day to day. Are you a little bit dehydrated today? Are you under stress from something today? Is this your second dive of the day, maybe? All these things can impact your susceptibility to nitrogen narcosis. But everybody will suffer from it, or will experience it, at some point. So symptoms can include mild confusion, loss of motor coordination, um, emotional changes. In some times, places, and people it can be paranoia, sometimes it can be ecstasy, not ecstasy, but giddiness. Um, outright hallucinations ultimately are one of the symptoms of nitrogen narcosis. Uh, it was actually Jacques Cousteau who gave it a rather fancy name of Rapture of the Deep, translated from French, uh, which is a little fanciful, but kind of gets the idea. Um, and if you're not aware of it, these symptoms can start without you recognizing them. Um, and things as basic as doing things like tying a knot gets more difficult for you without you really recognizing it, unless you're paying attention. So obviously nitrogen narcosis takes effect with significantly more nitrogen than is required for oxygen toxicity, because with regular air, you're starting with a 0.79 partial pressure, and you generally don't see any real effects until you hit 100 feet, which is four atmospheres, which means you're at something like 310% partial pressure, um, and then increases from there down. But this absolutely does have impacts on deeper diving. And this is why nitrox, 
largely why nitrox was developed and put into use for recreational scuba diving, because breathing in less nitrogen in the first place can make a lot of problems simpler. Not just narcosis, but also decompression related problems. And this sort of thing is what led to the development of a number of other alternative breathing gas mixtures, which we will touch on in a series of future episodes. So one is nitrox, just balancing nitrogen and oxygen. Of course, nitrox is not good for extended depth because of oxygen toxicity. So there were also experimentation, and in some cases adoption, of mixes involving helium and hydrogen as other potential alternatives or fillers for what would normally be nitrogen in regular air. And each of those has its own toxicity issues as well. So stick around and we will cover uh, nitrox and heliox and hydrox as well, and what those gases have to offer. All of these mixes are compromises. They offer some benefits, and always at the cost of some uh, negative elements as well. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.